We're beginning a, a new two-message series this morning called Once Upon a Time, The Two Greatest Stories to Tell. And uh, so we're beginning this uh, talk this morning in the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. And it's really fascinating because the first eight verses are going to expose us to a concept that is radically different than anything we've actually understood. The second will expose us to a second concept that will help us understand the first. And then the last two verses actually exposes us to a concept that helps us understand our world. So let's take a look at this and mark the first chapter beginning in verse 1. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, Messiah of God. I want you to notice the beginning of the, what's the next two words? Good news. If you're using your notes or you have a Bible open, you might just want to underline that phrase, good news, because it's going to show up multiple times in the text that we're examining this morning. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. If you look at the original prophecy that Isaiah was giving, he was talking about God. He was saying God is going to invade our world. And Mark is saying it is happening with Jesus and the person who's preparing the way is John the baptizer. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A radical concept. There was only one way in Jewish law for a person's sins to be forgiven, and it wasn't baptism. This is a very interesting concept that he's exposing people to. The whole Judean countryside and all the people at Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. How many have ever tried the locust and wild honey diet? <laughs> I guarantee you will lose weight on that diet. It's, it's sweet, and it's high in protein, and it's taking the country by swarm. Um, <laughs> see? Yeah. I'll just have you know, the last service thought that was a lot funnier, so. <clears throat> and this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my, next word, son. If you just underline that, it's huge. Understanding the second concept we're going to talk about today. Whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. There it is again, of God. The time has come, he said. The What's the next word? Kingdom. If you just underline that phrase, that's the essential word for understanding the third thing we will look at today. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe, and there it is again, the good news. I think there are two essential things that people are interested in life and want to know. And the first is this. How do you avoid difficulties in life? How do you keep bad things from happening to you? And our, spend, our culture spends a lot of time and a lot of money and produces a lot of material to help us with all of these things. We don't want to be confronted by things that are scary. We don't want to be confronted by things that are painful. And we don't want to be confronted by things that frustrate or anger us. And so there's lots of information available in our culture. If you do things this way, then you can avoid these things too. The second concept is how to experience a genuine transformation. The truth is, we all have this kind of internal mirror where we see ourselves, but it's not what we want to show other people. 
you can get a really good job, make really good money, drive a very nice car, wear very nice clothes, and hang around very impressive people and still think you don't belong in that group because of something you believe you know about yourself. And so there's a lot of effort in our world of trying to eliminate that inner image and experience a, a radical transformation so that we're actually who we desire to be, not just who we hope to be. And so this is a, a very interesting concept. By the way, religion actually uh, promises to address both of these issues and any religion in the world. The purpose of religion, by and large, is, is that if you follow the rules, you will avoid the bad things, and bad things will not happen to you, and you will become something other than you are right now, which is actually better. This is the concept. And it doesn't much matter what religion you choose. They're all pretty much the same in this regard. Follow the rules, and bad things will not happen to you. Follow the rules, and eventually you will become what you are not now. And so the challenge is, is that everything related to how we avoid these bad things or how we become what we hope to be is always based on our effort. I have to keep the rules. Now, some of us in this room are pretty good at rule keeping, and others of us in this room are not so good at rule keeping. And here's the challenge with the rule keeping approach to life improvement. And that is, if you're pretty good at it and life is going pretty well for you, then you make an assumption. I think I've got this down. And more than that, I actually think I'm good at this. And more than that, you will tend to look at other people whose life is a hot mess as though if they just worked harder at keeping the rules, it could be better for them too. So this little pride thing begins to rise in you and a little bit of condemnation thing begins to rise in you. And all the religions of the world operate on this. Uh, in in uh, uh, Buddhism, the, the goal is to kind of become enlightened. And so there's the eightfold path of enlightenment. As you follow the rules and pursue this, then your life will be easier and more enjoyable. And, and, and you will actually become what it is you hope to become. It could be the five pillars of Islam or the Ten Commandments of Judaism. It doesn't really much matter what the faith is. They all work on the same concept. And the goal is, is that somehow there will be a transformation in your life. In some faiths, that could take many lifetimes that you just kind of reincarnated. In others, it is this thing that occurs as you continue to live your life. And what I want you to see is that actually Christianity teaches us something remarkably different. The concept in Christianity actually keeps us from becoming proud because there's something that we learn. And it keeps us from becoming condemning or looking down at others because of something that we know about ourselves and about our God. So the problem that we have is that when we start talking to other people about the Christian faith, they just assume it's like all the other religions of the world. It's all about, you just have a different set of rules. You just have a different person who's in charge. But at the end of the day, it's your ability to keep the rules that will help you become what you want to be and avoid what you want to avoid. And so people, this is what I will tell you, even in Christianity, there are lots of people who treat the Christian faith that way. They believe in Jesus, they put their trust in Jesus, but they're trying to live out their faith based on an old religious system. And this is very challenging. So when you go to talk to somebody about the Christian faith, what they will tend to hear is, it's all about the rules. And if they've been raised in a place where there was a lot of rules and it didn't work so well for them, they're not interested at all. There's another group of people, and these are the no rules people. They don't want any rules. They don't want someone else's life imposed on them. They want to live their own life, so they will make their own rules. Now, you might think, well, if you're making your own rules, then you wouldn't be tempted towards pride or towards condemnation. Except my observation is, is that the no rules people very much look down their nose at the rules people. If you would just get rid of your rules, then you could be as good as I am, which of course is a problem. Do you see the challenge? And so people kind of live out their Christian faith with this model. And when we try to tell other people about the gospel, they just think, oh, it's just another rules-based religion. And if I surrender to it, then my life might get better. 
that it is an incredible difficulty for us to be able to share our faith. And when you try, they're not hearing what you're saying. They're hearing other things they've been told their whole life. So how can we actually tell the story of God in a way that people understand how radically different there is not another religion in all the world that teaches what Christianity teaches. That, like when people say all religions are the same, they really should say all religions but one are the same. And Christianity isn't better because our rules are better. Christianity is very different. Let me explain what the difference is. The first is the gospel is good news, not just good advice. The gospel is good news, not just good advice. You see, we have been saved by grace. You are saved because of what God has done for you, not what you are going to do for him. The news is something that has already happened. If someone comes to you and they says they have good news, and then they're trying to make something happen, that's not news. That's hope, that's dream, that's goal, that's advice, but it's not news. I went to a car dealership one time. I was interested in buying a car. And the, the, the man that I spoke to, the salesman that I spoke with, he said, I have good news for you. I said, do you know? He said, I do. I can get you into this car today. Today is the day. Now is your accepted time. I mean, it's just good news. And I said, all right. I said, but that's not really the, the car that I'm interested in. And I really don't like that color. And how much is this going to cost me? He said, oh, I know it looks expensive, but we can break this down over very manageable monthly payments. I couldn't afford it. I didn't want it. And I didn't like it. How is this good news for me? <laughs> it's good news for him if he sells that car that evidently nobody else wants, which is why it's still there. Right? People do this. They come into religious places and they hear about the kinds of things that you can do and should do. And this is how to better live your life. And if you do this, life will work better. And don't misunderstand me. There's plenty of advice in Scripture. But Christianity is good news. It's not this could happen if you do. It is this is what happened and you should know. Jesus Christ did this amazing thing where he substituted himself for us. And all of the punishment from our sins went on him. And all of his righteousness that he had earned came on us. It has been done. It's already concluded. There's nothing in history that can change it. That is good news. That's good news. So, it's something that has done. Now, good news, something that has been already happened. When you look at somebody says, well, they'll look at Scripture and go, well, I don't really know if I, I believe everything about Jesus. You know, like, was he really born of a virgin? Was, did he really raise from the dead? Did, you know, I don't know if I, you know, I, I think he was a good teacher. But please understand this. If Jesus is not who he said he was, then Jesus could not do what he said he did. So, Scripture matters. So when it says good news, it's news. This has happened. Right? The second thing is that the gospel reveals that you become a child of God when you believe. Uh, you're not going to evolve towards this. You're not going to work towards this. You become a child of God when you believe. God does not wait to see how your life goes to decide if you are his child or not. It would be like bringing home your little bundle of joy You've just had a little baby, and you bring home the little baby, and there the little baby is, and it's just, it's so beautiful, and, 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 and you just look at it and you say, okay, now, uh, I'm going to wait to see how you turn out to see if you are actually my child or not. <laughs> and you know, there have, been, there have been families where words like this have been spoken. No child of mine would ever have an academic performance like that. No child of mine would ever be that poor in athletics. And kids hear that, 
and it hurts. And there are people who try to do the same thing in the Christian faith. You must not be God's child if you're not smart enough, or you don't know the rules enough, or you haven't performed enough, and you haven't lived this out enough. And they really struggle with the idea that the moment you believe, the moment you believe, you become a child of God. God doesn't wait to see, let's see till we get to the end of their life. Okay, let's see how many good works they have, how many bad works they have. We'll see where the, no, 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 no. This last June, my daughter got married. And uh, after the ceremony was all over, there's a reception. And at the reception, there's this wonderful tradition. It's called the father-daughter dance. Yeah, see, you know the tradition. And so they said, it's time for the father-daughter dance. And my daughter walked out on the dance floor, and I walked out on the dance floor, and we danced. And what I want you to know, that is not the moment my daughter became my daughter. That's a moment when it was confirmed, it was assured, it was celebrated that she is my daughter and has been my daughter her whole life. Why does this matter? Because when Jesus came out of the waters of baptism, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. And there are people who actually believe that's the moment Jesus became the son of God. That's not when he became. That was not how or when he became the Son of God. He was already the Son of God. That's just a moment in which there was confirmation and assurance and a celebration of who he is and why he's here. Does that make sense? So the moment, this is fascinating. In all the other religions of the world, we're going to have to wait to see how this works out for you. We're going to see if you can evolve your way up, if you can work your way up. You're going to stand before God. And I hear Christians say this. I just hope when I stand before God that there's more good works than bad ones. Because what? Let's say you're one ounce over on the bad ones. Is he going to go, oh, you were so close. <laughs> you're not my child. It, it, really? Is that what it is? This is what's fascinating. When we approach spirituality like that and our faith like that, we become afraid. There are some people who think Christianity is just a fresh start. God forgives everything in the past, but now he says, don't screw it up. You got your redo, don't mess it up. Is that really all that comforting? I mean, have you really been all that good up to this point? And what makes you think you can change now just because you've been forgiven? Do you see the challenge? And so the moment you believe, look, let's look at this. Paul talks about this in Romans. He said, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. See, I'm afraid I'm not good enough for God, and then he forgives me, and now I'm afraid I won't be good enough for God. How is that any better? That's not the good news. That's an opportunity for lots of advice, but not good news. So what does he say? Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to, next word, sonship. You become part of God's family, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we, what's the next word? Not going to be, not might be, not hope to be, not will eventually be, but you are right now a child of God. If you place your faith in the good news, the historical event of what Christ has already done for you, in that moment, you don't have to work a whole lifetime for it. In that moment, you become a child of God. Now, you know what? People get very anxious about this. Well, if we've already got it, then what is the incentive to change? If I'm already a child of God, I'm already going to heaven, then why can't I just live any way that I want? So let me ask you, why were you trying to live better before? To avoid bad things and to get what you wanted. Do you really think that Christ came so that you could live for yourself? Just avoid bad things and get what you want. Some people come to God 
and they try to use him to get what they really want. When you've experienced the good news, when you realize it's already been done for you, when you realize that the moment you place your faith, that very same second you became a child of God, now when you do something that, that is hurtful to God, you see it's less about the breaking of rules and more about the breaking of his heart when you do that. You don't want there to be any distance between you and God. You're not trying to get something from him. You're trying to get him. The God who loves you more than you ever thought was possible. The God who extends all the resources of heaven towards you in grace. That God, that God is the one you want to know all of your life. And I don't want anything to stand between me and him. Does that make sense? All right. This takes us to the third thing, and that is the gospel reveals that God's way of doing things is completely different from the way our world works. The, God's kingdom... The way he does things is completely different than the way our world works. So how does the world work? Well, let's, let's think about this for a minute. If you want to get into a good college, what do you need? Good grades and, you see, everybody knows. <laughs> they don't, you don't just walk into a university and they go, oh, welcome. Come on in. We'll just give it to you. No, 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 no. You have to get good grades. And you have to have money. And if your grades aren't good enough, it's going to cost you more. Like a lot of educational institutions will say, oh, yeah, we'll give you a discount because your grades are good. That, that's actually what it costs to go there. Um, they penalize the rest of us whose GPAs were not so impressive, and I'm in that group. You know, I've heard people say, I graduated in the top of my class. And I just tell them, well, I graduated. <laughs> that's all that really matters. Uh, or let's suppose you want to get a good job, then you need a good resume. Would you put on your resume the following information? You know, uh, just so you know a little bit about me, I tend to oversleep frequently. <laughs> I, I don't always keep my commitments. I do occasionally not show up when I'm supposed to. The truth about me is I tend to procrastinate quite a bit, and I am a little bit lazy, and I think I'd be a perfect fit for your company. <laughs> But just, everybody, you wouldn't get your first interview, much less a second one. That's not going to happen. What does the world system say? You show me your value, and we'll let you in. And it works that way in every institution. And it works that way in every relationship. And it works that way in every interaction in the world's economy. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God has come, and he doesn't just do the same thing, only he's God. He does a completely different thing. He operates on a completely different system. It's absolutely amazing how much different it is. So you don't get into God's kingdom. Are you ready? You don't get into God's kingdom by proving how good you are. You get into God's kingdom by admitting how flawed you are. Isn't that amazing? We don't come to God and say, you have to let me in. I mean, look at all the stuff I did. Look how good I am. And God just said, yeah, that's, that's not how we get in here. The way you get in is you admit you're a hot mess. You make mistakes. You do things you shouldn't do. You don't always want to do the right thing. And even when you want to do the right thing, sometimes it's for the wrong reasons. And even when you want to do the right thing for the right reasons, sometimes you can't even pull it off. We are all a mess. And so that is why confession is so critical to the Christian faith. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it's happened to me where I have been asked to stand in front of people, it might be a family, it might be a classroom, and explain what my failure was so everyone would know how badly I handled something. And this is always the goal of the person in charge of that interaction, is that I will experience such shame in that moment in front of everybody else that I will never repeat that behavior again. And this is what people think confession is in Christianity, and nothing could be further from the truth. The purpose of confession in Christianity is to not make you feel bad for what you have done. The purpose of confession in Christianity is to remind you how much you need God. I've tried, 
and I can't quite get it. I am so grateful that in history, there was a moment in time when you took all the punishment for me and you gave me all the righteousness. I am so grateful that right now your kingdom is drawn near and the reason I am admitted into your presence is not because I have done it right, but because you have done it right. Is that not amazing? A completely different system. So we, we lean into confession. Now just look at Jesus. He doesn't operate according to the world systems at all. He refuses to use power to impose his will on anyone. This is a man who could calm storms. This is a man who could multiply food. This is a man who could heal sicknesses and diseases. This is a man who could raise the dead. Do you ever see Jesus ever saying to anyone, if you want something from me, then you're going to have to do something for me? Not once. You never see Jesus using his power to impose his will but rather to release his Father's will. It's a completely different system. He doesn't command armies to destroy his enemies. What does he do? He dies for his enemies, and he forgives them. Can you imagine any king? Can you imagine any dictator? Can you imagine any prime minister or any president going to his nation and saying, yeah, we don't really need a military anymore because I'm going to die for my enemies and we are going to forgive them. How do you think that election is going to go? Not long at all. Not well at all. Jesus operates on a completely different system. He doesn't create a system where he can show how much you are valued by how much access you have. You are really valuable, you get lots of access. You're a little bit valuable, you get little access. You're not really valuable, you get no access. Jesus does this incredible thing where everyone is welcome. Everyone can call on his name. Everyone can have a conversation with Father God. Absolutely everyone. Where in the world is a system like that? It's astonishing. Jesus feeds the hungry not the well-fed. Jesus heals the sick. He doesn't just hang around with other people who are known for their skills in healing the sick. Jesus frees those who are bound. He doesn't just try to avoid them or blame them for all of society's ills. He touches the untouchable, he eats with the unacceptable, and he doesn't keep his distance from the people who need him the most. It's a completely different system. There's nothing like this in the world. Nothing like this. That's why this is the best story to tell. God sent his son to take our place so that we could take his place. God so loved every single person that he gave his one and only son. And Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. The moment we accept that, the moment we believe that, the moment we receive that, we become his children. God does everything differently than the way our world does. There's no other faith system. There's no other governmental system. There's nothing like the way God does. That is the good news. That is the good news. So let me ask you this morning. Let's suppose on the way out, you get a text message on your phone, and it's from a car dealership. Only this time, this is what they say. We had a contest you didn't know that you were a part of. And our very best automobile, 2017, top of the line with all the extras, has been awarded and gifted to you. On top of that, we will take care of all of its maintenance for the lifetime of the vehicle. You will never have to pay for anything to be done on this car. All you need to do is come down, show your identification, and we will register the car today in your name. How many know that's a better offer than the one I had earlier? <laughs> and how many would be tempted to go for that offer? It's an IQ test, folks. Come on. How many would be tempted to go for that? And here's the thing. Do you know what you would do? You would get in that car. You would drive. How would you drive off the lot? 
look at this. This is unbelievable. Do you think you would wave to people on the street? Oh, you'd be the friendliest person in the world. Oh, hello, hello, hello. And, and, and if somebody said, how much did you pay for that car? Oh, how you would love to tell the story. This car didn't cost me one thing. This car was a gift. All of this is mine because someone gave it to me. And that you would, you would even brag about that dealership. They, I can't believe how generous they were. Look at what they did for me. And the reason, the reason we don't talk about our faith that way, about Christianity that way, is because we believe we're making monthly and weekly and daily installments. And we believe the system is rigged against us. And we're not sure this has really been a gift. It feels more like an obligation. And what I want you to know, when you understand the gospel, <laughs> you love everybody and you wave at everybody. And when they ask you, why are you so happy? It is a gift. It's a gift. Now, what about avoiding the bad stuff? Well, you should know that Jesus didn't come and give his life so that you would never have a hard time, a fearful moment, or a frustrating day. It's not why he came. It's not the work he did. His promise is not that everything will go right in your life. His promise is, is that no matter what you go through in life, he's going to be right there with you. This is not a God who breaks his commitment to us just because you are in a bad time or a bad place. And on top of that, his commitment is, I will use everything you're going through to teach you even more about my love and my compassion for you and to transform your life. God can use the good as well as the bad. He can use anything to bring transformation to our life. Aren't you glad we have a God who can use anything to help change our lives? Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, you might be saying it sounds too good to be true, and it is too good, and it is true. You can go the route of every other faith, and I don't feel the necessity of being disrespectful of other religions. I don't make fun of people who have different belief systems or no belief system. I'm just so grateful that there was a point in time when Christ became my substitute. And all of my punishment went on him. And all of his righteousness came on me. I'm so grateful that the moment I accepted that, that very moment, not a, not a probation period, not a test trial, not a lifetime evaluation, that moment I became his child. And I am so grateful that his kingdom operates on a completely different system. I don't have access to him because I am good. I have access to him because he is good. And he will never stop being good for me or for anyone else who desires to approach him. This, folks, this is the God we serve. So, Father, help us today. If there's a person today, maybe their whole approach to you has been about trying to prove to you how good they are. Would you help them freshly trust that it's good news? You have taken our place. We are your child, and everything is different. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.